Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I think we should start by remembering uh, that the BBC has just been asked to take pretty much a 20% cut in its budget. And I think there must be some senior executives and some people close to the BBC who are beginning to question whether, in fact, the deal that they made last summer is the good one and one that they are getting delivered on. Because presumably, I, don't, I wasn't privy to the conversations or the late night telephone calls, but presumably the nature of the deal was that if they agreed to this and to make a £650 million pound contribution to the Chancellor's black hole in his budget, then in return the BBC as we know it would be safe going into the future in two respects. One, that it would continue to be funded by public subscription through the licence fee, and two, that it would be editorially independent. Now, I don't know what's in the minds of the ministers, and we'll see as the debate on the white paper develops over the rest of this year and we go towards charter renewal. But it's the case that there certainly are still voices on the benches behind the ministerial team who are very hostile to the BBC and who will question whether or not the licence fee should remain in place and who will question whether or not they should be obliged to have more privatisation and more of a commercial motive in their output. And I thought that that had gone and the BBC needs to take cognizance, I think, that that debate is not over. On these benches, as my colleague from Eastern Bartonshire said, we are absolutely committed to public service broadcasting. And I think we should remember that the opposite of having a public service ethos in our, broadca in our broadcasting is to have a commercial one where decisions are made on who, how many viewers you can get and how many programmes you can sell in an international market. In my view, that makes for bad programmes. It makes for removing innovation, removing creativity, removing experimentation. I want to give I want to illustrate this by an example. Probably my favourite television programme on air at the moment is Peaky Blinders. It's a gritty BBC drama series set in 1920s Birmingham about gangsters of the time. It is rich in social realism and it is rich also in its attention to period detail in every respect but one. It has a contemporary electric soundtrack to a period drama. Now, some would say that on paper that doesn't work and, in fact, that would spoil the programme. But actually, the electric guitar of Jack White and others in that soundtrack enhances the menace in the narrative that's on the screen. Now, I bet that if somebody had taken that idea to, uh, to a, an independent uh, to a, a commissioner whose principal objective was how many viewers can we get and how many of these can we sell, they would have sent it back saying, no, I want a soporific score which is reflective of the uh, ragtime or music of the period. So an experiment would have been denied. Now, that might have sold more copies, it might have had more viewers, but it would have been a much worse programme as a result. I think there have been steps forward, sometimes baby steps, but steps forward in the way in which the BBC is operating, and there has been some decentralisation that is extremely welcome, and I think it has resulted in better programmes. If you look, for example, at the forensic and, and high-energy uh, examination of corruption in the alleged corruption in the, the Metropolitan Police, and consider that that is produced by a production crew in Belfast, who would have thought they would have been the best equipped to do that? If you look at things like uh, Shetland or Hinterland, you can see gritty crime drama that's set very much in the vernacular of the Scottish Islands or of Aberystwyth, and yet commands an audience which is general and which is much wider than that. Because by exploring diversity, you get better programmes which can be enrich the entire output for everyone. I wanted just to turn uh, to the situation in Scotland in the, the time I have left, which is um, my, my friend from Eastern Barnshire made uh, some points that I want to reiterate. But the first thing to say is that I do think the management of the BBC are playing catch up and not playing it very well in terms of the decentralisation that has already taken place within the government of the United Kingdom. It is welcome, of course, that now in the, the new Scotland Act, the Scottish Government has got a say in how the charter renewal process right, right. takes place, a say in the management of the BBC. But is it not really remarkable that 20 years almost after the creation of a Scottish Parliament, we're debating that they should have these limited powers? 
We believe, we put forward the amendment uh, in the Scotland uh, Bill debate, we'll put it forward again, that broadcasting should be the responsibility of the Scottish Government in Scotland. How can it be that the Scottish Government is entrusted by this House to make decisions on assisted dying, on, on abortion, on running all the public services, on, on what rate of income tax to charge people, and yet it can't control, control the telly or the radio. It does seem to me to be a, a, remarkable, uh, a, 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 a remarkable situation. Now, we believe that in the process of charter renewal, some of these debates can be revisited. And as my honourable friend said, uh, we think a model that the BBC should look at would be one of a federal structure where the licence fees that are collected in Scotland are controlled and directed in <coughs> Scotland by people who uh, understand what they are trying to do, uh, where the programme making and the commissioning is controlled in Scotland, most of all so that the considerable resource that is available there can support our creative industries and the talent and the artists that are there in our own country. At the moment, many of them do not, and many of our best creative talent is obliged to travel 400 miles south to ply their trade in this city, and I don't think that's something that's acceptable in the long term. Oh, yeah. Now, I think most people would probably agree uh, with that when we give examples of uh, drama or entertainment, uh, that the output should reflect the place in which it is being made, but it is most important when it comes to the question of news and current affairs. And I think, uh, I th I think the bench is opposite misunderstand, or perhaps deliberately misunderstand, our concern in this respect. There was talk earlier of sour grapes and, and sore losers. I mean, do remember I'm speaking on behalf of a party that's getting quite adept at winning elections, by the way. But our concern is not about sour grapes or being sore losers in any event. Our concern is about the fairness and impartiality of our national broadcaster. Now, when the Secretary of State therefore says that he thinks it's the role of the BBC to keep the nation together, that becomes a non-neutral statement in the context where the constitutional future of our country is, shall we say, a matter of divided opinion. And it's not a matter of reviewing the 2014 referendum result, but it's an understanding that there are different perspectives within the Scottish population, and almost 50% of the people do not agree that staying in the United Kingdom in the longer term is the best option for us. They would like to see self-government of their own country. Now, I'm not arguing about who's going to win or who's going to lose that argument, but we should accept that there is more than one opinion. And therefore, to deny that that, and for the BBC to take an editorial view that there, the nation must be kept together, by which I presume they mean the UK, means that many, many people will feel disenfranchised, they will feel alienated from the national broadcaster. And that has to be a matter of concern, I would have thought. Now, I know the Secretary of State's opinions are his opinions, and he doesn't control the output of, of BBC Scotland, of course that's right. But I would suggest that having senior politicians who take that view is going to have some effect on the people working at the coalface and making the programmes. And I think we need to say quite clearly to BBC Scotland that it is their responsibility to reflect the diversity and the plurality of opinion that exists in that country, oh, yeah. rather than take sides in this matter. And I'll finish, Madam Deputy Speaker, by saying that I know from speaking to senior executives at BBC Scotland that the Director General now has four, I don't know if they're videotapes or DVDs, but he has four pilot episodes of a potential Scottish news programme on his desk. And they vary in as much as the degree of control that is being influenced by the Scottish editors and producers. And I hope that he will take the bold and commendable step of taking the most ambitious of those and committing to allowing the people that live in Scotland to view BBC Scotland through their own experience and in, in a way that reflects their Aye. own lives. Yeah. Yeah.